Hello and welcome. My name is Laura Johnston and I am the Scientific Associate Director in the Flow Corps. And this is the training course for the Spectral Analyzer, also known as the Aurora. So to start out, I want to go over what spectral cytometry is and specifically how it's different from conventional flow cytometry because most of you probably have already done some flow cytometry within our core. The main thing with conventional flow cytometry is that we have one detector assigned to one fluorophore. So you can see here we've got the, spec the emission spectra of BV421 in blue and then this rectangle is representing the detector for that fluorophore. We also have the same thing for FITSI, so the emission spectra and the detector, and PE and ABC. So you can see one fluorophore, one detector. But the thing about this setup is that this filter set, this detector, doesn't actually capture the entire emission spectra of the fluorophore. So we're actually missing out on some data. And SciTech likes to use this analogy of the iceberg, where this is really only capturing the tip of the iceberg. With spectral cytometry, we sort of shift our view a little bit, so that instead of one detector, we utilize all of the detectors within the instrument to look at all of the fluorophores. So this is the arrangement of our current spectral analyzer. So we currently have four lasers. We have the violet, blue, yellow, green, and red. Um, at this time, we don't have the UV laser, so if you are using a BUV dye on our X20, for example, then you would need to find another replacement. You wouldn't be able to directly transfer that panel onto this instrument. Um, I will tell you that we are getting the UV laser at some point in the near future, but at this time, we currently have four lasers. So each laser has quite a few detectors. There's a total of 48 detectors in this instrument, and the UV laser will add additional detectors. And you can see they're a, bot, they're a lot narrower than the conventional cytometers. So the first v detector, V1 here, starts at 420 nanometers and ends at 435. The next one starts at 436 and goes to 451, etc. Um, so we pretty much capture all of the spectrum. And so our data looks something like this. You may see plots that look like this. These are signatures of the fluorophore. So each, each fluorophore is identified by its distinct signature. Um, so to orient you to what these graphs are, if you look at just a single detector over here, we've got the V1 detector. We've stained this fluorophore with beads, so we've got a positive peak and a negative peak, and we've got the intensity on the x-axis. But if you rotate this sideways, so we put the intensity on the y-axis, if we just look at the positive peak, that's what this is showing here. So this is just like a heat map of the histogram, and in this case, we're only gating on the positive population. So uh, for each fluorophore, typically there's a peak. So for BV785, it peaks in V15. For PE, it peaks in yellow, green, one. Um, but you can see there's some, I guess, minor peaks in the signature as well. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter if two fluorophores peak in a similar region, just as long as uh, the entire spectrum has some sort of unique pattern to it. So on that note, what makes spectral cytometry really exciting and allows us to look at multiple so many colors in a panel, so we could look at 24 colors in one panel, for example. Um, we can do this because spectral cytometry can separate very highly overlapping fluorophores. One example of this is APC and AF647. So the signatures are shown here. You can see in the red laser, they're quite similar. They peak very close to each other. But if we look in other parts of the signature, for example, the violet laser and the blue laser, we see some differences. And so what this looks like in actual data, um, on the top we have an example using PE and APC. So we've got CD8 on APC, CD56 on PE, and these are the populations that we can find. If we switch the 
CD56 to AF647, so now we have these floor fours that are very close to each other, we can still resolve these same populations. So I will say that just because we can separate these population or these floor fours doesn't mean that it's really easy to separate the floor fours. So you will notice that this was planned carefully so that the CD56 and the CD8 are on different subsets of cells. So it does make things a little bit easier to put them on different subsets, but we definitely can resolve these floor fours. Now I just want to give a bit of an overview of how what it's like to run on the instrument. It is very similar to a flow cytometry workflow. So in conventional flow cytometry, you would start with running your single stain controls and setting your voltages. You probably have to go back and forth between these two until you're happy with your voltages and then you can record your single stain controls. Once you've done that, you can do compensation or you can save this for later. Then you can run your fully stained samples and then analyze those in whatever application you're used to, either Flojo or FCS Express. Um, and you can also do compensation in these applications as well. For spectral flow cytometry, very similar. The first difference is that you do need unstained cells. So every single experiment must have an unstained cells tube. You will not be able to do the unmixing if you don't have unstained. So remember to bring an unstained tube. Then you can run your reference controls. That's what they call the single stains. And then at this point, you can do the spectral unmixing. So you can do this similar to compensation, or you can save it for later. Um, but usually we recommend doing it at this step so you can look at your data. Um, then you can run your fully stained samples and then analyze it exactly the same way that you're used to analyzing data. And again, you can perform the spectral unmixing after the fact. Um, at this point, Flojo does have capabilities to do spectral unmixing. I don't feel that it's quite as user-friendly at this time, um, but there will be other programs available to do spectral unmixing. FCS is coming with, out, that with, out with that soon in the near future. Um, but what is the unmixing? So the unmixing is an algorithm. Um, we start out with raw data. So this is what I showed you before, the signature of the data. Each of the parameters here is the different detectors, so we'll have 48 parameters. Then once it goes through the unmixing algorithm, you'll get the data that you're used to looking at. So you'll get your BV421 and your BV510 and whatever colors you've used in your panel. So you do get two different sets of data. The raw data, it is an FCS file. Um, the parameters, as I mentioned, they're going to be the different detectors. So if you open that up in an analysis program, you'll just be able to look at V1, V2, all the different detectors. Uh, when you're running in the actual software on the instrument itself, you'll visualize this data in a raw worksheet. The file size will be a bit on the larger side because there are so many parameters. And these files can be unmixed as many times as you want. So I would recommend saving the raw data. Um, I imagine that as people start publishing this data, if journals are asking you to submit your FCS files, I would not be surprised if they ask you to submit both the raw and the unmixed FCS files. So I would definitely keep the raw data. It is very useful. Then your unmixed data, again, it's gonna be what you're used to looking at. It's got your fluorochromes, in the software, you're going to visualize this in a separate worksheet, so you can flip back and forth between these two worksheets. Um, the FCS file sizes are a little bit smaller than the raw data, but remember that you cannot unmix an unmixed file. So you're going to need to keep the raw data if you want to go back through the unmixing. Now you're probably wondering how the unmixing works. It is a little bit confusing because it's this mathematical algorithm. And I went to this conference called CYTO and went to a workshop called Spectral Unmixing, which is put on by David Novo, who is the creator of the FCS Express software. So this is a modification of his explanation of how unmixing works. So we start with a really simple system. Let's say you have two fluorophores that you're looking at 
and your analyzer just has two detectors. And when you run your controls, your single stains, you find that your average emission of fluor 4 one all of those photons, 80% of those photons are going to be picked up in detector 1, and 20% of the photons are going to be picked up in detector 2. Whereas fluor 4 2 is a little bit different. Instead, 30% of fluor 4 2's photons are going to be in detector 1, whereas 70% is going to be in detector 2. And then when we look at each fluor 4 in total, fluor 4 1 is going to be pretty bright. It's emitting 5,000 photons. And fluor 4 2 is a bit dimmer. It's only got 500 photons emitted. So if you imagine one single cell passing through the laser and emitting its, fluor, uh, its photons from the fluorophores, we can use this initial information and calculate what we'll see. So fluor 4 1, 80% is going to be picked up in detector 1, so 80% of 5,000 is 4,000, and then 1,000 is going to be um, in detector 2. You can calculate the same thing for 442, so we'll know that in detector 1 we're going to observe a total of 4,150 photons, um, and in detector 2 is 1,350 photons. So obviously when we run an experiment, we don't get all of this information. What the unmixing does is helps us solve the information. So when we run a multicolor tube, we get this observed information. So we would just know that we would observe 4,150 photons in detector 1 and 1,350 in detector 2. And when the unmixing does, it helps us calculate how many photons are coming from fluor 4 1 and how many photons are coming from fluor 4 2. Now, let's switch over to a bit more of a graphical explanation. So, again, we've got fluor 4 1. This system is a little bit more complicated. We've got 16 detectors. So, here's a signature of fluor 4 1. Here's another signature of fluor 4 2. So, these are our two reference controls. You can imagine if we put these two fluorophores in the same tube, then we're going to observe a pattern that looks something like this. So we need the unmixing to tell us how much of each fluorophore is contributing to this overall observed signal. So what the algorithm essentially does, it takes your reference controls. If we imagine putting those sideways, we can get an intensity value or I guess it would be a percentage for each detector, and that allows us to create a mixing matrix. So for this mixing matrix, you know that our instrument has 48 detectors. So for our instrument, we would actually have 48 rows, and then for each floor four that you add to your tube, you would get another column. So if you're running a 24 color panel, you would have 24 columns. So you can imagine this mixing matrix can be get pretty large and complicated. And then the math is somewhat straightforward. So we have a mixing matrix that we've created from our reference controls. We have the abundances, which is our unknowns. That's what we're trying to figure out. And then we also can do the same thing with our observed signature and get observed values for all of the detectors. So if we multiply our mixing matrix time the times the unknowns and that will give us the observed. And so we just need to solve for A. Now, I'm not gonna tell you how to do this math because I'm not an expert at how you do matrix math and having 24 unknowns, but this is essentially what the algorithm is doing. And I like to explain this to really highlight that the reference, reference controls are absolutely critical. So you can imagine if you do not give the software a, an appropriate reference control, then how is it going to figure out what's in your actual sample? So if your actual sample contains GFP and your reference control is FITSI, then it's going to be looking for a FITSI signature when in reality there's a GFP signature. So there is no FITSI signature. and Therefore you would get unmixing errors if you do that. So the reference controls are absolutely critical for obtaining proper unmixed data.